So Heaven Bible Study Part 34 tonight. So we're in the book of Ezekiel. And I actually was originally going to go all the way to chapter 40 tonight, but I'm saving 38 through 40 for next week because it's going to basically be a mini revelation study. There's a lot of stuff in, in those few chapters. But just a quick review from last time. So Ezekiel 25 through 32, we saw that heavenly Zion is called the mountain of God. And if you remember, that was in contrast to the mountains that the pagans believed their gods were dwelling on. Also, the devil was cast out of heaven. Uh, rebels go to a conscience hell when they die. And remember, there's some kind of reunion in, in hell celebrating the arrival of another, another lost soul. Also, we see that God is the sovereign, holy judge. And those three things are very important together. He is the judge. Everybody's going to be standing before the Lord. He is sovereign, meaning he is in control. But let us be thankful that he is holy, that he is good. And we know that he is a righteous judge. We see that the day of the Lord will be a day of judgment. And if you remember, many times the day of the Lord that's mentioned in Scripture kind of has a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. So a lot of times the day of the Lord may have been representing a particular time of judgment that was coming quickly on a nation, sometimes on Israel and Judah. But also it was a preview of the day of the Lord that would come at the end. We also saw that the nations used to judge Judah would be judged. So as we've been looking through Ezekiel, you remember the Babylonian attack and the three different times that Babylon, Babylon would come in and take Judah away. And there were other nations celebrating and kind of joining in and uh, being glad at Judah's destruction. But they too would be judged and even Babylon themselves would be judged for their sin. We also saw that God will restore Israel. So this is a promise that the Israelites, those faithful Jews, were always holding on to, is that no matter what was going on around them or what was going on with their nation at the time, they knew that God was going to remain faithful to his people. So our heaven definition is heaven is a spiritual realm where the greatest intensity of God's presence dwells eternally. It is a holy place because God is there. It is where God rules from his throne in the heavenly temple with the resurrected Jesus at his right hand. Holy angels and the souls of the redeemed, those that have been forgiven by grace through faith, live in heaven. Satan currently has access to the heavenly courtroom and accuses the saints daily. One day, Satan will be cast out of the heavenly courtroom forever. The souls of the redeemed saints will be reunited with resurrected and glorified bodies and will dwell on earth with Jesus for a thousand years. After the millennium, God will create a new universe and earth. Heaven will come down to earth, and the redeemed will live forever with God in a glorified body on the new earth. So if you turn with me tonight, starting on, actually on page 5, but we'll be looking at chapters 33 through 37 of Ezekiel. So the first question tonight is, who goes to heaven? And these are really some answers that we've seen in the other books as well. But the first one is those who repent. That is, they turn away from their sins and they turn to God. This is from Ezekiel 33, 10 through 11. It says, Therefore, you, O son of man, so speaking to Ezekiel, say to the house of Israel, Thus you say, If our transgressions and our sins lie upon us, and we opine away in them, how can then how can we then live say to them as i live says the lord god i have no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from his way and live turn turn from your evil ways for why should you die o house of israel you know from judah's perspective it seemed hopeless because they knew they were guilty as god's judgment came upon them and said how can i be saved you know we know that we're guilty. Our transgressions and our sins lie upon us. We pine away in them. How can we then live? You know, sometimes people will get to that point where they really, they do feel hopeless. But we, as we know from Scripture, it is not hopeless. What does God desire of us? Turn to Him and live. So we see that through His judgment upon Judah, that He's holy, He's judging sin, but He's also compassionate and forgiving. And I just love verse 11. And this is actually in another part of Ezekiel as well, if I remember correctly. 
It says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. God does not want to judge the wicked, but in his holiness, he will judge the wicked. But he tells them to turn. And what does that mean but to repent? You see it just being emphasized at the end. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? Isn't that just... Don't you feel that with sometimes your, your loved ones you know that are lost? You're like, why should you die? Why should you die? You know, the Lord has given us that open invitation to turn to Him and to live. To find forgiveness. And this was still a promise to those of Judah. If they would repent, they would live not only a blessing on earth, but they would live forever with the Lord. Also, who goes to heaven is the doers of God's word. There's always a connection between faith and works. Works do not save, but works show the evidence of true saving faith. A person that really trusts God. For what does it mean to trust God if you don't listen to him? But as Ezekiel was bringing this message to, at this point it had been the exile, some of those that had already been taken out of Jerusalem by Babylon. This is from Ezekiel 33, 30 through 33. It says, As for you, son of man, the children of your people are talking about you beside the walls and in the doors of the houses. And they speak to one another, everyone saying to his brother, Please come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. So Ezekiel knows the people are listening. God says, hey, they're even talking about you when you're not around. You know, they want to know, what's, what's the Lord got to say? I've been taken out of Jerusalem. What's the Lord got to say about our situation? In verse 31, it says, So they come to you, as people do. They sit before you, as my people. What does it mean, as my people? Were they really his people? If they're not listening, they really were not followers of God. He said, they sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Heart issue. I said before, I hate that phrase, follow your heart. <laughs> you see it on t-shirts, bumper stickers, <laughs> it's garbage. That's da da danger. <laughs> it's dangerous, because what does the Bible tell us about our heart? It's wicked, it's deceitful. Our heart's going to lead us astray. Because we're always going to be selfish if we're just following our hearts, aren't we? And God knows our hearts. Just as he knows the hearts of those in Judah. He says, they hear you. And they act like they love what they hear. But their hearts pursue their own gain. Selfishly, they go after what they want. Not what God has told them they need. And in verse 32, it says, Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not do them. And when this comes to pass, surely it will come. Then they will know that a prophet has been among them. So when judgment has come, come to pass, they're going to know God was serious about what he was remember saying. Remember what he said. That's right. Remember these words. God is is faithful and true and when he tells you to do something he means it and he means it to judah as well so they were they had warning obey god and again it reminds me of the book of james and when he talks about dead faith so a dead faith is a person that's not really saved they have an intellectual knowledge of who god is but there's no fruit there's no evidence that they have actually changed that they've been born again but those who have a living faith it's testified by their works just as abraham you remember, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But where did his faith get demonstrated at? But when he went to offer Isaac. So he already was declared righteous by faith, but his actions showed that he truly trusted God. You know, if God is going to fulfill his promises through Isaac, even if I was to sacrifice him, surely he'd bring him back from the dead. That's faith, isn't it? Confidence in what God says is true. Judah, were not, they were not trusting God and his word. The next part, what happens when we die, and we talked about this last time too, is that death is a, a form of judgment. Now, it is true that all people die, but death is a form of, of judgment. It's a, a part of, of life. And as we look at Ezekiel, we see that there's this responsibility of the watchman. And 
This really should weigh heavily on us as Christians because we have the responsibility of the Great Commission to go and tell others, to warn others that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And as Ezekiel was the watchman, he was to go and to tell Judah the truth about their sin, about judgment, and if the people would turn, they'd be saved. But if Ezekiel did not go and warn them, then he was guilty of bloodshed. He was basically as good as a murderer because he didn't tell the people. He didn't warn the people. But he did. He was faithful. But this is Ezekiel 33, 7 through 9. It says, So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. So it starts with a warning, doesn't it? When I save the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die. And you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. He's guilty of bloodshed. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. I think it's serious for us to, to fulfill the Great Commission. Mm -hmm. To say exactly what God's word has to say. What was Ezekiel preaching but judgment? Now what are all these mega churches and fancy health and wealth prosperity churches? They don't preach judgment. They don't preach hell. Those are the things, you know what? If there's something that I could throw away from scripture, it would be hell, wouldn't it? I mean, we don't want our loved ones to go to hell. Do we really want anybody to go to hell? We shouldn't. What did God say? Does he enjoy the fact that wicked die? He says he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But God is holy. And God will judge sin. So we must preach judgment. We must preach hell. We must tell people the truth. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So death is a form of judgment. And there was a warning brought to Judah. In the next part about what happens when we die, we see that God is sovereign over death. Now, this is from Ezekiel 35 and 8, and it's really speaking to the nation of Edom. If you remember Edom, they're basically kin to the Jewish people, but they were constantly a thorn in the side of the Jewish people, and they were later called the Adameans. Does anybody remember in the New Testament a famous Adamean? Herod the Great. Mm. He shouldn't even been the king, but he was the king there. The Rome had established him. So they were a constant thorn in the Jewish people's side, even all the way into the, to the New Testament. But they have practically vanished from the earth. And a lot of it's fulfillment of prophecies that God had spoken about judgment upon them. The Ezekiel 35 and 8 says, And I will fill its mountains with the slain, on your hills and in your valleys, and all your ravines, those who were slain by the sword shall fall. What I want you to notice is the very first part of that and I will fill its mountains mm -hmm. now who is it that has this killing Edom I mean is God literally going down there with the sword and killing them mm -hmm. what about Judah were the people being literally killed by God going down and killing them the sword it was Babylon right for Judah mm -hmm. and Edom was being judged by another nation and it was Babylon as well but God makes the claim I will fill its mountains so you see he is sovereign over death and I've heard people say before that God is like the master chess player. Takes all the pieces and he puts them and uses them perfectly in his way and for his purposes. And we see that throughout scripture. As the Assyrians were used to judge Israel, but the Assyrians were judged. Babylonians were used to judge Judah, but the Babylonians were judged. And just on and on and on, we see that God's purposes are always fulfilled even when wickedness abounds. Even when wicked nations rise up, God is always working all things for good to those who love him, always to his purpose. And I think we can think about that on our in our individual lives as well. People love to quote that verse that God works all things for good. Now, why do they usually want to quote that? For those who love him. Right? Can't miss that point, can you? So it's only for, for Christians that this promise is that he's working all things for good. But does that mean that everything in your life is just going to turn out good then? No, no. So what is that he good? He still punishes. He does. He corrects, doesn't he? So what is that good? The end result. Which is being made like Christ. 
And that's how he works all things for good to those who love him. He's making us more and more like Christ. He's making us a holy people. And as you look at Judah, as they're being judged, they're being refined, what is he doing? He's making himself a holy people. He's purifying the people. He's removing those that are not true followers as well. God is always sovereign. And he's sovereign over death. He's sovereign over the, everything that was happening to Judah and everything that happens even to the church today. As we've gone through this, and I didn't reference a particular verse, but how can we know anything about heaven? Remember, it's special revelation. And Ezekiel is just uh, chock full of, thus the Lord says, and the Lord commands Ezekiel to speak. So the last question is always our, our summary question, just kind of a catch-all of some of the other things going on in this section. So we see that God hears and God judges. And this is actually pointing to Edom as well. And this is Ezekiel 35, 10 through 13. It says, Because you have said, These two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess them. Who are the two nations, two countries? Judah and Israel. Judah and Israel. You got it. If I had a cookie, I'd give it to you, Lisa. That was good. <laughs> Judah and Israel. That's right. So Edom, they want their land, don't they? And they want to take advantage of them. And God says, therefore, as I live. What does it mean? He's already said this in another passage you looked at. Therefore, as I live. What is God saying? I'm still around. going to be there. Yeah. That, that's that where it's always going to stand, isn't it? God is always. God, therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, is guaranteed. I will do according to your anger and according to the envy which you showed in your hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them when I judge you. Now, God doesn't just judge arbitrarily, does he? He's judging sin. And Edom were guilty according to their anger, according to their envy. God is going to judge them. He's going to pour it back onto their own head. And look at verse 12. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have heard all your blasphemies, which you have spoken against the mountains of Israel. So really against God's holy land, against his holy people, it's as good as blasphemy against God himself when the people are attacking his people. And he's heard it all, hasn't he? Is anything outside of God's hearing, his vision, he knows exactly. That's why he is a righteous judge, because he knows all the facts. You know, sadly, sometimes in our justice system, sometimes people are wrongly accused and wrongly convicted, because we don't always have all the facts, do we? But God does. He hears. He knows. He is a righteous judge. And it says, uh, they are desolate. They are given to us to consume. So Edom is just desiring Judah and Israel's land. In verse 13, Thus with your mouth you have boasted against me and multiplied your words against me. And how does he end that? I have heard them. I've heard exactly what you're doing. I've heard exactly what you're saying. You know, who gets away from the judgment of God? He hears all. He sees all. And he knows our hearts as well. So even those that put on a good show, he knows who really belongs to him. He knows the hearts. So God hears and God judges, and Judah knew that. And it's also we see that God is a righteous judge. Again, this is such a great truth for us because we know that God's not going to do anything wrong. He's a righteous judge. He's a holy judge. He's right in all the judgment that he brings. This is Ezekiel 33. And I'm just going to read 17 through 20, but you can read 12 through 20 as well. There are more details to this passage. It says, Yet the children of your people say, The way of the Lord is not fair, but is their way which is not fair. Do people say that now? Why do they say that now? The Lord's not fair. What, what do they mean by that? Well, it cuts in on their self-justification. Right. That, that's, a, that's a good word. Self-justification. That's right. They well, want to be right. Self is told. I mean, you, you oh, know, why would a good God allow not allow me to do what I want to do, right? right? He's not fair. That's what people say. <laughs> oh, you, the Lord's not fair. Why is this happening to me? The Lord's not fair. In verse 18, he says, When the righteous turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, he shall die because of it. But when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is lawful and right, he shall live because of it. Yet you say the way of the Lord is not fair. 
O house of Israel, I will judge every one of you according to his own ways. What are we judging? Can't judged? blame it on anybody else. No passing the buck, is it? Mm -mm. You can't go. You go all the way back to come down on us. <laughs> all the way back to to the Garden of Eden. At the fall, Adam says, "That woman you gave me." So he's blaming Eve yeah. and he's blaming God. Mm -hmm. That's your fault. It's not my fault. And then to Eve, the devil made me do it. Mm -hmm. Same excuses are being used today. But what does God say? I will judge everyone according to his own ways. That is, if you live a life that's supposedly following me and you suddenly turn away, don't be surprised when you face judgment. And if you are wicked in your life and you turn to me, don't be surprised when you're blessed. God is fair. And God will judge all according to his ways. He's a righteous judge. Do you think we've ever made it clear to people who walk the aisle, shake the preacher's hand, Get a dip. Not, Have we really made it clear? Not always. What's expected? I think that that is one of the most unhealthy things about the church and as a whole. Not just not saying us, but just in general. I think there are a lot of people that think they're saved because of something they've done, and not because of the Lord. And, you know, it's scary when you read passages like when the Lord says, depart from me, I never knew you. He's like, mm -hmm. I did all these works for you, Lord. Mm -mm. But he knows our hearts, doesn't he? He knows who truly is a follower of God, who has truly been born again. And I'm afraid that there are a lot of people that feel like they're justified because their name's on a membership roll or they've been baptized or confirmed or whatever it may be from the various different denominations. Is Yeah. I think that's something we should take serious as as a church here, as Little Stevens Creek. One of the church, I won't say where, but I attended, the pastor would always tell the people that walked down that he was going to counsel with them mm -hmm. before they brought before the church for church membership. Mm -hmm. And that was the reason. He wanted to make sure that they knew it's not something you outwardly do. It's something you inwardly do. Yeah, yeah. And I always make sure before I do baptism that, you know, I, I counsel with individuals to make sure they really understand what the commitment is. But, man, we could just always do better. Always do better. You know, some churches do membership classes. And actually, this is one thing that the Reformed Presbyterian Church does I think is pretty neat, is you have to go through like a year's worth of classes before you can join their church. I had a doctor that worked with, and he was in the army, so he wasn't in any particular place for a you know extended amount of time. So he never became an official member of the church because he couldn't get through the membership class in time. I thought that was that's kind of interesting, but it makes sure that you really know what you believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that's a very good point. We need to make sure people really know what it means to follow the Lord, and it means sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we do preach too much of a cheap grace. As Dietrich Bonifer said, cheap grace. But when Christ says to take up the cross and follow him, he really means it. Mm -hmm. He really, really means it. It's not easy either. No. Nope. Well, going on to our next part, Israel will be restored for God's glory. I don't know if I've added it in that way before, but it's for God's glory that Israel is restored. That God is going to fulfill his promises. People are going to see that he fulfills his promises and it's going to be for his name's sake, not really for the people's sake, for God's own glory. So this is Ezekiel 36. We're going to look at 20 through 28, but again, the bigger passage is 16 through 38 if you want to read that on your own. But on verse 20, it says, When they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said of them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they have gone out of his land. So Judah has been kicked out. Israel has been kicked out already out of Assyria, in by the Assyrians. So they're spread out. They're in these lands, and God's name is being profaned in these foreign lands. Now, one thing, the Israelites were probably living just like everybody else. They profaned God's name. But two, what is the accusation? They says these are the people of the Lord. Yet they have gone out of his land. In other words, their God must not be strong. Their God must not be powerful. Because if their God was strong and powerful, they'd still be in their land. So they're profaning his name 
because of their, they've been judged, <laughs> because they're out of the land. And in verse 21 it says, But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel has profaned among the nations wherever they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. So as God fulfills his promises, the people are going to see that God is, he is powerful. He is true to his promises. And in some ways we can say that as Israel returned to having a, a state in 1948, that's the beginning of showing that God's promises of putting the people back in the land. And it's going to be fulfilled even more so as Jesus returns. And the millennial kingdom would be set up as well. But God is doing this for his own name's sake. But you know, as we look at Israel and Judah, many times we may think, man, they had so many great gifts from God. They saw God's work among them. God had blessed them in so many ways. Yet they were so hard-headed. Stiff neck, the scripture says, and they didn't listen to him and they profaned his name. And I wonder, is this us today, the church? I think so many things we look at Israel, we just need to say, well, that's easily the church too. For that we are stiff neck many times, hard headed. And how much have we profaned God's name? Are we in lands that we shouldn't be in because we've been judged? Are churches falling apart? Because God is judging them. Mm -hmm. Our church is going further and further away from his word because God is judging them. And his name is being profaned by Christians that are living just like the world. What does God say about that? He's not pleased. And I think we should take the judgment very seriously. Always God is calling us to holiness. And let's never ever forget that. Holiness is always the direction that he calls us to go. Verse 24 goes on. For his fulfilling, uh, fulfilling the promises to Israel. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. So again, he's fulfilling this in a way now, but it will be even more so in the Messianic kingdom. But you can see this even fulfilled when the church was born. For you remember at Pentecost, the people from all the different nations, the Spora Jews, they came into the land into Jerusalem, and they heard... The great things of God spoken in their own tongues. So again, God is showing that he's, he's doing a work among them. In verse 24, we read something that's pointing, it's the new covenant. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. So right now, the new covenant is already active. So God is cleansing people, washing them from their sins, giving them a new heart, taking out the heart of stone. So what does it mean for a heart of stone but a heart that can't be entered, right? He's given us a heart of flesh that we can be molded. So all of us as born-again believers, we have received this new heart. We have received God's spirit. He says, I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. This is why we endure as Christians because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. We'll never be satisfied with sin. We'll never be satisfied away from God. He's always working on us. Some of us are a little more hard-headed than others. There's things being worked out all the time. God is refining us. He's working in us. This is a promise to Israel too. And you know, you look at the first church in the first century, it was mainly made of Jews to start with. But as time went on, it became more of a Gentile-based religion. And today, that is the reality. But in the end, we see that there is going to be an importing of Jewish people in trusting Jesus as the Messiah. And they will receive this blessing of the new covenant. They will be saved. 
And it says, then you shall dwell in the land. And this is going to be fulfilled at the end. When Jesus returns, the people will come in. Jerusalem will be the capital of the world. And they're going to be in that land that, that he had promised to their fathers. And what does it say? You shall be my people and I will be your God. Great promise. And again, for those faithful Israelites that faced Babylonian captivity because of what was going on in the nations, they needed hope, didn't they? And I think as a church, as we look at God's Word, we need hope too, don't we? When we look around, we read the news, just the terrible things going around all over the world, in our own nation, and the further and further our nation gets away from God. It's a scary time. We have hope because of God and that God will fulfill His promises. And this next part, so this is really looking at the belief in the resurrection. It's a very famous passage. You may have even sung the song as a child, dim bones, dim bones. So here's where the passage comes from. This is Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. So the dry bones of Israel will live. Now this is a prophecy of a national resurrection. So Israel will be brought back. But it's really compared to the individual resurrection that will be experienced as well. And it makes sense to Judah as they hear this because they believe in an individual resurrection. They believe that at the end that God will raise the dead to life. And we know that Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. He has risen from the dead. And it's a promise to us that we too, our bodies will rise. And so this is not really describing that end resurrection, but it's using that imagery uh, for them to describe a national resurrection. And as you read this, just think about God's power. One thing that pagans were actually criti critical of the church early on was that they thought the resurrection was such a ridiculous doctrine because they said, how is the God is going to bring people back to life when, you know, maybe someone gets burned up and then their ashes fall into the sea and a fish eats part of the ashes and a bird, you know, something you're spread everywhere. How is God going to be able to bring that body back to life? Boy, they don't know God, do they? <laughs> God who spoke everything into existence. Put it back together. That's right. I yeah. thought that's the biggest mistake. Man tries to base God on his understanding. Exactly. Our limitations. God and, and people are totally different. You know, not based on what we say, feel, think, or do. He's still God. You know? mm -hmm. All the time we want God to think and feel like we did. And, uh, no. That's right. You know, the resurrection is mysterious in many ways, but man, God can do it. <laughs> and New Testament describes it as sort of like a seed. So whatever it is, some element of our bodies that are left behind. That's all that God needs. That's all that God is, is something of who we were. And he's going to make us into a new creation with a new body. So this is from Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord came upon me. And brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. So you think about this vision. These bones are just scattered. I mean, you're not having skeletons just laying, but it's just scattered bones. <laughs> Who's going to put this puzzle together? Then he calls me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. Indeed, they were very dry. That's dead as dead can be, right? Mm -hmm. These bones are dry. Dead and scattered. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Isn't that powerful? Bones, <laughs> hear the word of the Lord. Death, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones. Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you, and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. What that statement? Then you shall know that I am the Lord. He just shows his power and says, yeah, I am the Lord. Here's my power. Verse 7. So I prophesied. As I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Mm -hmm. Imagine that imagery. Bones coming together, 
all these muscles and everything coming together, covered with flesh, and they were still dead. Why were they still dead? No breath, God. No breath in them. Verse 9, Also he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Mm-hmm. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. There's a lot of imagery connected to the Holy Spirit in that uh, breath mm-hmm. coming from the four winds. Come to them, they may live. In verse 10, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, Our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. So this is a promise to Israel that the nation will be restored. This is a national resurrection. But you just see the imagery of the individual resurrection too, don't you? That God's power. (laughs) These bones, very, very dry, dead as can be. God brings life. And that is such a, a... Great hope for us. Look at them. They said, our bones are dry. Our hope is lost. But is anything hopeless when God is in the picture? Not at all. So a great truth of the resurrection. And if you remember, we read about the resurrection in the very oldest book of the Bible in Job. When he says, in my flesh, I will see the Lord. So the resurrection was something that Israel held on to from very early on. And, you know, it's not hard to to believe that a lot of the Israelites that first became Christians because they they heard about Jesus being risen from the dead, you know. This, yes, we've been taught about the resurrection all our lives. And here's the Savior that has come. And here, let's read a little bit about the Savior. For in Ezekiel, God will uh, shepherd Israel. So the setting of this is God was judging the shepherds of Judah or Israel. They had not done what they were supposed to do. They had not healed the people. They had not led the people. And they had really exposed them to all kind of dangers. So what does he say? I'm going to be the shepherd. Yeah, shepherds, you have failed. And I've heard this passage actually used for pastors. And it's a very scary thing as well, just like the watchman passage. Because, you know, as as a pastor, I am a under-shepherd of God. And there's a great responsibility. And I fell in so many ways, and I honestly, I just, I burdened myself in, in, in thinking about these things, but by God's grace, He allows any of us to, to be in such a role, but it is a serious role. It's a serious role of, of care of souls. But here God describes Himself as, as the shepherd, and there's actually two passages, one in Ezekiel 34 and one in Ezekiel 37. We'll look at verses 21 through 28 from 37 tonight. It says, Then say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. So there's that promise of restoration. And that's really a fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. You know, that they were going to be brought into the land. They're going to come back. Fulfillment to Abraham. Verse 22. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. So now there's a promise that fulfills the Davidic covenant. Unification. The one king over all of them. Because remember, Israel and Judah have been split for a long time. Israel was taken away by the Assyrians, and now Judah's taken away. But God, as he comes back to his people here and restores them to the land, he says there's going to be one king. There will be no two nations ever again. And who is that one king? Jesus. It's Jesus. Verse 23. They shall not defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. 
but I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned, and I will cleanse them. Then they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Now we've got a picture of the new covenant. They're being purified. So they've been restored, Abrahamic covenant, to the land. Then they've been unified under the Davidic king, and they are going to be purified. This is the new covenant. I will cleanse them, and then they will be my people, and I will be their God. Verse 24, if you had any question about it, it was Jesus. David, my servant, will be king over them. Now, David's been dead a long time, hasn't he? Even by this point in Ezekiel. How is that David's going to be the king over them? Jesus. That's right. The tribe of Judah. And they shall have, all have one shepherd, one king, one shepherd, who is Jesus, but our good shepherd, watching over us, protecting us. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Very different than what Judah had been doing. They were hearing, but they weren't doing. But now there's going to be a change as they've been purified. They've been born again. They're going to walk in the judgments. And Jesus, King Jesus is ruling. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt. And they shall dwell there. And they, their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Hey, David's dead, remember? David's descendants lived and they died. Those kings kept getting replaced. How is it that the servant David shall be prince forever? That's Jesus, mm -hmm. who lives forever, who reigns forever, who rules forever. And verse 26, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. That's the new covenant, the promise through Jesus Christ that we are saved completely, that we are forgiven of our sins, we are justified, we are sanctified, and we are glorified one day, that resurrection. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. Do you remember what happened before Babylon destroyed the temple? God's presence left. It left. And as we look through this study, you remember that heaven is the great place it is because of God's presence. Judah, we're blessed because of God's presence. But when his presence left, Babylon was able to destroy the temple. But now here's a promise that his sanctuary is going to be in their midst forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. So there's several fulfillments here as... Jesus returns one day and rules on the earth and the nations see. Israel's back in their land. He rules from Jerusalem. There is that one final rebellion before the new heaven and the new earth is created. And God's presence yet again is with them forever. You remember in Revelation, we read about that there's no sun in the sense that the light doesn't come from the sun. It comes from who? Jesus. Yeah, yeah. God's glory spreading everywhere. You may have never even paid attention to this before, but if you read the creation account in Genesis, light is created before the sun's ever created. Where does the light come from? It's God himself. And that's exactly the new creation is also, it's going to be God that is the light throughout everywhere, his glory. So he'll be in their midst forevermore. And what a great promise of what heaven will be. For we will be safe. Our one shepherd will be with us. We will have light. There will be no darkness. He will be leading us, guiding us, protecting us, and healing us. So great promises for all those who trust in the Lord. So God's work in Ezekiel 33 through 37. We see that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked and urges them to repent. Followers of God hear and obey his word. God is sovereign over death. He hears and he judges. But again, it's a great truth that he is a righteous judge. Israel will be restored for God's glory. And he will shepherd his people and dwell with them again. And we see this in the image, particularly of Jesus ruling on the earth, but in the new heaven, new earth, where God's glory is everywhere. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that our next lesson is going to be looking at verses 38 through 40. I encourage you to read that if you get an opportunity before next time. But we'll be looking a le talking a little bit about the Antichrist and the time of peace with the Antichrist before the tribulation. 
Armageddon, the final battle, and the new temple. All this is in Ezekiel, just in those few chapters. And it'll carry on a little bit longer after chapter 42, but that'll be our main focus for next week. Anybody have anything to add or questions? A lot of good stuff in those chapters tonight. Mm -hmm. I always wonder how America fits into this. Because it was unheard of. It was unknown. Mm Mm-hmm. It's hard to say. I mean, it's just speculation, really. Some think that America was going to be gone completely. Could be. But you know what? I'm not worried about that. We don't need to be worried about that. I think people can get consumed with trying to figure out end-time prophecies and things of that nature. And certainly we should, you know, recognize the signs. But if you're right with the Lord, it doesn't matter. We know the end of the story. So whether if America's here or not, it doesn't really matter. Jesus coming back. <laughs> That's all that matters. That's all that matters. Anybody else? I think it's very relative to when God first created man. You know, what did he breathe the mm-hmm. breath of life into? Yep. The same thing with bone. Yep. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That is where life is the breath of God. All right. Well, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for your word tonight, and I thank you for the great hope that we have in you, the hope of the resurrection, the hope in the return of Christ, the hope of your rule over all the new heaven and new earth where death itself is even destroyed. And I do thank you for these great promises, and help us to understand the great responsibility that we have as well to warn others that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank you that we know this great truth. I thank you that you have given us a new heart. And I pray that we would just continue to hear your word and do your word, that we would respond as a church body, Lord, that we'd be pleasing to you as a church, and that you just continue to guide us as individuals, guide us in our families, guide us just every day, Lord, that we would again be pleasing to you, that we would be a holy people. In the holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.